Hello everyone, um, my name is Jacob Pleath. I'm a senior reporter at um, Evaluate Vantage. Uh, welcome to this podcast, which um, is focused today on the PD1 uh, report that we recently published. Um, it's actually the fourth in a series of overviews of the PD1 space, uh, looking at all the latest developments, looking at the, the upcoming catalysts, um, and it's available on free download. So do do that. Um, to help discuss the latest trends and catalysts, I've got with me Bertrand Delsuc, who is the publisher of Biotech Radar. You also will know him on Twitter. He's an essential follow on BioTwitter, so do follow him if you don't already. Bertrand, uh, you've you've looked at the report, and I think you've got a few thoughts and a few questions. Uh, so take it away. Uh, what did you? What struck you about the the latest developments in the PD one space? Yes. So first, uh, Jacob, thanks for uh, having me in. Basically, uh, with regard to the um, overall landscape, we still see a lot of activities in terms of, uh, let's say, regulatory decisions uh, on a, almost on a weekly basis. We still see uh, a lot of uh, clinical trial readouts. Uh, no later than uh, this week, we had uh, quite some news from uh, from Merck, some positive, some uh, uh, less uh, positive, some negatives, basically. But still, uh, we we see the, the landscape evolving. Uh, now, uh, let's say moving across the treatment paradigm from uh, uh, you know the later stages uh, where it basically all starts, and uh, then going back to the earlier uh, stages, basically with uh, adjuvants and uh, neoadjuvant settings. So that's still something that is uh, let's say that that we see uh, every day. Then on a new report, um, we also see uh, some uh, interesting trends, and uh, we also saw some, let's say, outstanding deals. Uh, we will uh, probably discuss that uh, a little bit after. And uh, also, uh, well, there is uh, some major catalysts, uh, as you say, and uh, let's start maybe with uh, the digit, uh, the digit stories. Yes, uh, so T- Tidget um, sort of refuses to go away, doesn't it? Um, so we had the what everyone I think saw as very disappointing readout from Roche's Skyscraper One study, um, and then later on last year we saw the, we had the first look at PFS from uh, the Arcus study of um, Arc Seven, which I mean it was technically positive, but I think you know to me it was a, still a little bit disappointing given how how uh bigged up this study had been um and this all sort of plays as you say into the the major catalysts of this year which is um firstly we need we, we're looking for further data from skyscraper one um now this is we've been promised the first look at overall survival um and this was either going to be in february or if not then the study will continue uh to some point um in the second half of this year well it's it's March first, so we've had February. So I think we have to assume that this this hasn't uh, shown a sufficient effect to, to report. Uh, but it's also not negative because Ross said it would report it immediately if it was negative. So that's a wait and see. So again, we we have a second half catalyst for um, overall survival in that study. Um, I mean, also, I mean, what do you think? You know, so the sort of body language from Roche is that this study is kind of pretty much a failure but i think a lot of people uh, analysts are increasingly saying you know about this whole statistical plan that you know maybe there is a hope that os could hit i mean what's your view on that well uh my view is very simple it's it is a roller dice and uh let's see what what will happen in h2 uh basically uh well uh it all depends on how much it failed uh, on pfs basically because that's the only thing we know. The the thing we do not know is what was the, the targeted uh, PFS uh, for uh, for this for Sky Zero One. So, I mean, if the target was dot five for the hazard ratio, and that it missed dot five, it still gives room for the OS, let's say, because assuming uh, it will the benefit would be diluted for the overall survival. Yeah. Uh, it still leaves room to reach uh, the common target of uh, hazard ratio, which is basically around 0.75 or uh, something like that. Yeah. Then yeah. if it missed 0.6, it leaves less room for the dilution on, on the OS. And then 
uh, you may have some headaches about that. So um, as we do not know how how fail it failed, <laughs> how mm. how big was the failure, um, it is difficult uh, as of today to to be categorical. But yeah. certainly the body language uh, of Roche was uh, incrementally uh, let's say less positive a long time. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, if you remember, you we had. The head of, of pharma that previously uh, talked and, and left for for Bayer, Bill Anderson, yeah. uh, previously said that uh, you know uh, this is Roche speaking. You have to uh, um, have some credit about what we say when we say that uh, we saw a, a trend on, on PFS and on OS, a positive trend uh, at the first interim readout. So um, big question mark then on a, yeah. how much credit you have. <clears throat> yeah, so I guess it, it was Roche really that triggered all this interest in Tidget. And uh, so I mentioned ARC7, the Gilead Arcus study of their um, Tidget and PD-1. So the next readout, um, so Arcus yesterday confirmed will be ASCO. Uh, so that's another read of PFS data. Um, and again, there's some suggestion they could be, they, you know, it could improve versus what they reported in December. Um, and maybe some other lower key digit catalysts. We've got the first look at the Merck study, KeyVibe 002. Now, this is in a strange sort of second line lung cancer setting. Um, and I think that the, the um, previous results in that trial have not been spectacular. So I'd be surprised if that worked. But then their big studies, KeyVibe 003, first line, same setting as ARC7 or Skyscraper 1. But that doesn't read out until later. Um, the other thing I think you mentioned on Twitter that Beijing's got some interesting Tidget readouts this year, and they've actually got a first line lung cancer study, which is a phase two, and that that will that will be the first indication as to whether their Tidget could do anything. And finally, AstraZeneca has said that they're going into pivotal trials this year with their Tidget PD1 bi-specific. So that's a uh, that's suddenly you know suddenly a lot of digit catalysts happening. I mean I don't know what Astra is hoping to get with a with a bi specific that you know others think they can get with using two separate antibodies, but we'll see. Yes, sure. And um, well, about Merck, what is striking is that uh, uh, their program uh, engulf uh, engulfs uh, sixteen indication or sixteen yeah. uh, cancer types. So I mean. Uh, they didn't uh, didn't start a, a program just to see. I mean, uh, I guess there must be some level of conviction uh, underlying this uh, the launch of, of such a broad yeah. program. So, uh, well, uh, it is a, a, a bit puzzling to to see su- such thing. Also, we we um, can note that the um, the program from Merck. Is basically a co-formulation, which is, uh, you know, is, is a bit different from the approaches simply to take a, an anti PD one, an existing one, and uh, adding on top of that another agent. They, are, they have been, I mean, it's a, a bit aggressive to uh, to uh, use such a such an approach. So uh, will it pay off? Uh, I guess we will see. But uh, as you noted, I mean. Uh, we should have uh, a first answer from a pivotal uh, trial from Vibosto and um, Pembro uh, this year. About Gilead, well, I guess you, you are, um, the notes in your report are say, say it all, I would say, uh, about the underperformance of, uh, yeah. of the anti PD1 uh, agents, Zim. Um, then uh, about all the discussions, then uh, about. Uh, does FC silent or FC active really matters? Uh, that's also uh, another point we can say uh, on this class of agent. Mm, yes. Okay. Uh, anything else? Um, um, a... Well, um, maybe uh, we can also talk uh, just a little bit about uh, uh, ITOs and, and GSK because um, wh- one thing you you noted uh, rightfully uh, previously about all these. these uh, these combination uh, trials is that uh, uh, even if Rush succeeds, ultimately, will they be uh, uh, the the real winner after that? Because if, when you compare directly with respect to to Pembro, 
uh, usually it hardly hardly beats pembro monotherapy and uh, then um, the question is whether the the winner ultimately is not uh, uh, merck and uh, and pembro that's uh, what i mean uh, so uh, and uh, also one thing to notice is that uh, if you remember last year um Uh, GSK presented data from uh, uh, trial head-to-head -head, uh, pembrolizumab with uh, dostarlimab called Perla. This trial showed some uh, positive trend for uh, uh, superiority potentially for dostarlimab versus pembro. So if uh, if TGIT is a thing, I would say, maybe it has some potential at GSK uh, with the, the uh, ITOs agent Uh, on top of the Starlimab, because for once the the baseline uh, for mm. comparison would be the Starlimab and not a PDL1 agent. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I mean, I guess and GSK could do with some luck, couldn't it, in oncology after after a while? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Highly questionable, but I mean, yeah. Yeah. That, that, they have bet big uh, on this. They have assumedly uh, a, a more comprehensive. Uh, Coverage of the TGIT pathway with the uh, uh, TGIT and CD96. Um, any other any other themes that you struck you from the report? Yes. So uh, the other point I, I wanted to highlight is uh, um, RR, basically the uh, um, new agents of the bispecifics using a PD1 or a PDL1 backbone. And uh, starting with um, uh, the agent from uh, AstraZeneca that caught my eye um, last year. Um, AstraZeneca presented, so they have an agent called Medi5752, or now uh, called the Volrustomig, with yes. the new uh, denomination of the INN. And uh, it is a PD-1 by CTLA-4 uh, by specific. They presented two sets of data last year, a first one in RCT at ASCO, and the second one in a uh, first line uh, uh, NSCLC head-to-head Pembro on top of chemo uh, at ESMO 22. And uh, um, I found that interesting because uh, the efficacy data were uh, really outstanding, but uh, there is a but here. Um, the uh, safety and tolerability uh, profile was uh, clearly not acceptable as it was presented. So uh, what uh, AstraZeneca will be doing now, uh, or what they started to do uh, already, was to decrease the dose. And uh, given the early signs of efficacy, example given with uh, uh, some activity in PDL1 negatives, uh, which is still remains a, a, an uncovered or uh, an unmet need, I, I would say, across the, the tumor types, uh, I, I think that this data set could be Uh, interesting, or at least that makes an agent uh, of interest to to follow. Notably, that uh, um, AstraZeneca earlier this month uh, during their uh, their earnings uh, highlighted that they they were planning five phase threes uh, to be launched yeah. this year, including one in a non small cell lung cancer. So um, I think that uh, if you are already an established player in that landscape. Uh, it is worth to have a look at, at this asset. Yes, and I think Astra is interesting because obviously Astra is the only company apart from Bristol to have got a CTLA-4 antibody approved. And uh, something I talk about in the report is the uh, you know, M-Judo, uh, as they yes. call it now, is, is now approved in two uses in the US. And, you know, 11 and a half years separated the first approvals of Yervoy and M-Judo. So clearly Astra you know, thinks it's onto something. But I, I still don't quite understand why they are betting on this bi-specific approach. Where and and by the way, this is, this is one of these conditional bi-specifics, isn't it? So it only binds CTLA-4 in the presence of PD-1. And I think the idea was that this could improve on the toxicity. But when I last spoke to Astra, they actually said they were still not sure about the uh, safety profile of this agent, and they, I think they had they were showing some liver enzyme elevations, and I. It just surprised me that they've gone so quickly now. They're, they're launching this big pivotal program for a project which, which to me still had some question marks hanging over it. 
but uh, it did not seem that the optimal dosing regimen was already established, but they probably have a good view on what it could be. And especially uh, if you look at uh, what happens as of today in the oncology landscape with the project Optimus, uh, given that uh, this agent will probably be um, uh, combined with other regimen, uh, chemo or, or other, uh, it is pretty important to the, eye, uh, to the eyes of the FDA uh, and the regulators in general to find the optimal uh, dosing regimen. So first question, is there a window? And then is there a window when you have uh, it on top of uh, of, uh, of SOC uh, regimen? Yes, yes. Um, something else that I should point out also in the report, I don't only talk about the US landscape, I look at the global picture and um, you know, especially China is, is quite prominent. And I, I talk about recent Chinese approvals and, and Chinese catalysts. Um, and I guess since we're on the subject of PD-1 CTLA-4 biospecifics, uh, you know, it's important to mention that ACASO has actually got another one approved. This is called Ketani. It's approved in China for second line cervical cancer. Um, I don't know an awful lot about this biospecific, but um, you know, it's interesting that, that there is another dual acting biospecific that hits CTLA-4 that's already on, on the market somewhere in the world. So Definitely. And uh, maybe it's also a, a trend to do uh, new, new things with old things. So I, I guess that's also a, a nice segue to, to talk uh, about the, the main deal that happened uh, Yes, uh, the last, uh, the later part of last year, also involving Akezo. Uh, maybe you uh, you want to to talk about that deal? Well, yes, this is a, an extraordinary deal. This is where Summit, uh, the you know one time UK biotech uh, distressed biotech, was used basically as a as a vehicle for for doing a five hundred million dollar upfront deal fronted by Bob Duggan, the former CEO of Pharmacyclics to buy rights to ibonescumab um, from Akezo, as you say. So, so ibonescumab is a dual acting, so this is PD-1 VGF, VEGF by specific. So this is like, um, you know, PD-1 plus Avastin combined in, in one molecule. Um, a, a quite extraordinary amount to pay for an asset that until the deal was done was, was pretty low key. Um, I think we saw some data on it at ASCO last year, but that was it really. Um, so yes, uh, I mean, an approach I don't, again, particularly understand the logic of, I mean, that there are some Avastin combos approved in the PD-1 space, but again, I'm not quite sure what you'd achieve better with a, with a bi-specific of this sort, but also clearly a, a great endorsement for Ocaso's, um, you know, antibody, uh, technology, uh, in, in a broader sense. Yes, uh, definitely. And. There is also um, the dimension uh, uh, of the in investment uh, and the risk associated with uh, this asset since the data were generated basically only uh, in China, I believe. Yes. So, um, I mean, uh, there is also this question that will uh, the data uh, generated in Europe and in the US, so the licensed territories, um, Will they actually reflect those uh, from uh, from Akezo? So Akezo, as you said, they presented two sets of data in uh, advanced uh, non-small cell lung cancer uh, last year at ASCO. Um, uh, one uh, in monotherapy and another one uh, on top of chemo. Um, among the the interesting things, there 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 was the um, ORR. Uh, or our data of overall um, uh, response rates uh, that were in very interesting and uh, sometimes even striking, I would say. Th there was also an activity seen uh, post EGFR TKI. Uh, that's uh, pre pretty interesting to note since uh, yesterday we saw failure from Merck in uh, in this setting. We also see some activity post anti PD1 chemo failure. So. Well, uh, it also depends on what sort of regimens were available or uh, are available uh, in China. But there has been, let's say, some quite compelling data generating in China. Then the question is, was it worth 500 million upfronts? <laughs> because yes. that's a 
pretty crazy. And uh, even uh, saying that today, uh, I, I still have difficulties. But uh, then maybe um, we, we can move on also on some other names uh, using uh, the PD-1 or PDL one uh, approach as, uh, for, uh, for other bispecifics. Uh, I have found a few from Roche uh, who has uh, a PD-1 by IL-2, uh, so IL-2 variant. Yeah. Another one with a PD-1 by uh, LAC-3 uh, on their side. And then you also have uh, AstraZeneca, who, as you mentioned uh, previously, has a PD-1 uh, by TGIT and also has a PD-1 by TIM-3. And uh, among, among the big boys, we also have Pfizer, who has a PDL one by CD-47. So uh, there, there has been some kind of traction for uh, using PDL1 or PD1 as a backbone for bispecifics, but uh, the jury still out if, if one of these will ultimately uh, make it to the to the finish line. Yes, yes. Okay, so maybe it's a, a good time to move on to other issues for China uh, companies in the US. As you mentioned, it's been very difficult for uh, studies generated in China to to serve as the basis for US approval. Um, this is, again, something I've spoken about in previous PD-1 reports, and again, it's a theme this time around. So at the latest count, we've got two complete response letters, so for Innovant and for Coherus. We've got EQRX basically abandoning its strategy to, to go into the US with um, Sujimalumab. And we've got three, I think, Miss Padufa dates owing to COVID travel restrictions, one of which actually is, is a case of itself with another molecule with Penpulumab. Um, so things are really not going well, um, certainly for, for China-generated data. That looks like a complete no-no. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see now what happens when, you know, where, if, if travel is able to resume and China facilities can be inspected by the FDA, whether that will, will shift some of these other um, <clears throat> approvals that are still awaited forward. Um, but that'll be interesting because obviously... Um, you know, there's there's a huge there's a huge uh, amount of developments happening in China in the PD one PL one space, um, and I guess we're just waiting to see if any of them can make a difference in the US. Um, I think an interesting thing I saw also was that um, Shanghai Henlius, which has a, a drug called Serpulimab, it recently launched a head to head US study against Tecentric which it said was based on positive feedback from the FDA. So this looks like an interesting new trend of a China company using what looks like an abbreviated sort of way of, of getting some data that it could then possibly use um, for a US filing. Um, and I'm not sure a lot of people spotted that, but uh, that's a phase three study. And I think it ends next year. So that'll be one to watch as well. Hmm. Do, do you believe it is linked that uh, it is in small cell lung cancer, which is let's say, uh, uh, high and met need, or do you believe it could uh, be more generalizable? It, yes, it could be. I mean, uh, bearing in mind also Tecentric is approved in small cells, so it's kind of a good indication to go for, maybe. You know, we know Tecentric works um, and it's mm -hmm. it's an unmet need, so if you're going to show something, you would hope to, to show it in this cancer and in this setting against Tecentric. Yes, and... Uh, it also depends on um, what kind of therapies are available also in China versus uh, US Europe in subsequent uh, subsequent lines. That's because true, yeah. uh, that's, uh, I guess, one of the main point, you know, uh, okay, uh, the FDA may be able to, uh, to perform, uh, let's say, the, the inspections, the on-site inspections in China, but uh, ultimately uh, the, uh, the comment about the, generalizability of uh, the data generated, this, that concern might may still re remain, I would say. Mm. Yes. Uh, I think also it's interesting that uh, we also await the EU verdict because uh, Beijing is awaiting four approvals in the EU, uh, some based on China data. So we'll, we'll see if the, what the EMA thinks about the generalizability of, of Chinese data as well to the European population. And, and then the, there is also the the story about the the coverage also in China because you may be approved, but then you also yeah. have to be yeah. uh, listed on the NRDL, yeah. otherwise you are left with the private uh, 
sector and it's at the moment I really don't know what is the size of uh, these markets but uh, assumedly you you really have to uh, uh, be listed on the NRDL uh, to really exist um, something else I, I noticed uh, was since we mentioned to Centric, um, was this approval they, that Roche got in the US in alveolar soft part, soft part sarcoma. Um, very, very strange. And I think I wonder whether this is the start of another trend, because this was an academic study. I don't think Roche ever mentioned it. And then suddenly it's got approved. And yes. the, reason, the reason I thought about this was that um, obviously Jen Purley made a big splash at ASCO with this um, MD Anderson study in adjuvant rectal cancer, which which was a study that GSK almost denied knowing anything about initially, that they never press released the result. And this was a study that sort of brought the house down in ASCO. Interestingly, very recently, there was this adcom where GSK actually thought, said, OK, we, we want to take this forward. And, and we sought guidance on um, how to take this forward into uh, into registration and um the FDA um, advisors voted um, in favour of two uh, seemingly smaller studies which might be carried out and uh, to take this use forward. But I wonder whether, whether we're seeing, you know, some some way whereby a farmer is, is taking more notice of academic studies which, which you know, have, have shown something perhaps unexpected and, and allowing that to drive their decisions forward as well as well as just taking you know an internal view and saying well no we want to see this approved in in this use and that use or whatever i don't know if you've got any thoughts on that yes i i, I uh, definitely uh, agree with you it was let's say uh, quite surprising um it's really uncommon at least from what i've seen so far to see uh, uh academic uh, trial especially when they are very small because if we uh, refer to the uh, rectal cancer study, it's uh, N of 12. <laughs> so 12 patients, is, it's really a, a small data set. However, the data are uh, very compelling. So uh, yes. almost a, a pristine uh, waterfall, uh, waterfall plot. So um, at, at some points, uh, I would say that the FDA cannot keep ignoring all these uh, small uh, academia studies when the data are uh, so uh, compelling and uh, maybe uh, uh, that makes the FDA a bit more prone to uh, to the flexibility they are used to to, to show uh, for, uh, for the private sector. So uh, I think that's a pretty in interesting point. That's also, I would say, uh, rewarding for uh, for academia, I would say, mm -hmm. because uh, um, I, I've been following uh, a lot of studies uh, actually from uh, from the NCI or other uh, academic centers, and so far, uh, not really to, uh, to to say bad things about that, but uh, so far I, I don't feel uh, it yielded uh, in, in a lot of uh, let's say positive things, despite the the investments. So uh, sometimes you you see these academia trials being delayed. Uh, it takes ages to uh, to uh, enroll patients, and uh, in the end, nothing really uh, really breaking uh, comes out of, of these studies. But here we have a few examples that uh, it can happen. So uh, I think that's a, a positive point. Yes, yes. Well, you mentioned rewilding, but how about rewilding that farmer itself is doing uh, in terms of um, loss of exclusivity uh, management? Um, so we've got, I guess this may be a good, a good point to close on, but, uh, you know, it's very hard to ignore the upcoming catalysts uh, in these subcutaneous formulations, which, you know, suddenly become a huge, huge thing and a huge way in which pharma might be able to uh, maintain uh, some of these sales from from the, the the IV antibodies, which which will start going off patent um, in just a few years. So I don't know whether you've got a, a view on this, but I've got three major catalysts this year. So firstly, Roche has filed to Centric based on the Imskin one study, and that's got a Purdue for date fifteenth of September. So that will be potentially the first subcutaneous PDL one um, to be approved. Merck has these data, which I think are imminent, uh, phase three data for a subcutaneous formulation of Keytruda. However, if I understand it correctly, this isn't the one they're 
their banking on. They've got another formulation, which, which like Roche's Decentric, uses hyaluronidase. And that started a study which doesn't read out until next year. And I think for some reason that it's, it's possibly more convenient formulation, but I think that's the one they're, they're banking on. Um, and then, of course, Opdivo um, subcutaneous trial, Checkmate 67T, that ends in December. So that might be a readout late this year, early next year. Uh, but lots happening suddenly in, in the subcutaneous space. So w w what is striking about these, um, let's say, these uh, bridging studies from uh, IV to SC is that uh, the primary endpoints are for this phase three uh, studies are basically only pharmacokinetics criterions. So really often the, the common pattern is that you will find among the key secondary uh, endpoints uh, ORR, which is uh, assumedly uh, the, the, the quickest way to assess uh, yes. equivalency in, in efficacy. But then if you really want to uh, say that uh, you have the uh, same long-term outcomes, so uh, PFS or OS, uh, all these endpoints usually can be found, uh, let's say, buried in the long list <laughs> of secondary endpoints. Yes. So uh, um, uh, my point is that, uh, okay, uh, you, you find equivalence in uh, exposure. Um, I mean, uh, uh, that's what has been done by Roche in their IMSKIN studies and, and uh, comparing uh, the exposure in NSCLC second line and comparing across um, across indications, uh, but uh, I, I'm still wondering if uh, this is uh, let's say the, the correct way to to assess this. Um, uh, so far, uh, if you look at the the IMSKIN study, it's in second line, so it's not the the, um, the setting where you expect the the best efficacy from uh, from Decentric. And uh, what I would argue is that uh, maybe if you really wanted to to assess that properly, maybe you you would find the the uh, the setting where uh, Tcentric uh, assumedly has the, the the best performance, just to make sure that it it has no detrimental effect uh, to uh, to bridge from SC to to IV. Uh, I think and... that I think that raises an interesting point because. You say that IMSKIN-1 is a second-line lung cancer study, but Roche clearly intends it to serve as a bridge across all approved eccentric indications. So there must be a reason why they're going for this setting. For some reason, it must be the easiest way for them to show this pharmacokinetic um, you know, equivalence. Well, uh, well one, one of the reasons is that uh, basically, if you look at the ORR that, that was published, I mean... It's in the very low, uh, I mean, it's almost single digit or very low double digit. And the PFS is very short. It's basically three months. So if you run uh, such a trial, you have the, uh, these, both of these outcomes uh, and PFS pretty quickly. If you do it in, uh, in first line, maybe you have to wait for longer. Then it comes back to my original question. Is it the, the, the correct setting? All right. Well, um, I think that's probably a good a good point to end on. Um, Bertrand, thank you so much for your insight. Uh, I hope you uh, hope you like the report, and I hope everyone who downloads the report will will enjoy it. And uh, obviously, this is this is something that we will be publishing uh, periodically. The next one should be out in three or four months, and we'll continue tracking all the the main developments uh, in the PD one space uh, and looking at all the main catalysts. Um, follow us on twitter follow bertrand on twitter as i say and um thank you very much yeah thanks uh, for having me and uh, see you uh, next time thanks bye